Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. In this video, I'm going to show you how to set up your Canon EOS R for bird photography. How are we going to do that? We're going to go through all of these menu settings that apply to birding. We're going to go through the Q menu. We're going to talk about the autofocus system. I'm going to show you the seven different autofocus methods that you have to know how to use and when to use. I'm going to show you where they live, how to invoke them. And then at the end, we're going to go out in my backyard. Our birds are having a feeding frenzy right now because we just put their favorite bird seed in. And we'll see how this Canon EOS R works in real time with two different lenses, an affordable 100 to 400 RF lens, about $650, and then a very expensive 100 to 500 RF lens, which is almost $3,000. So it should be a lot of fun. Um, I'm going to put a beginner section here, and then I'll timestamp things below so you can jump around as needed. So off we go. Okay, guys, this first part of the section is for the beginner. So this is your Canon EOS R. Now, if you're more experienced, please jump ahead. I have everything timestamped down below. But if you're a beginner, welcome. This is your EOS R here. Uh, I just reset mine to the the latest firmware 1.8.0 so I suggest you do that if you just bought this camera uh, it has that firmware it's been around for almost a year so things haven't changed and this is a new a recent video this is f almost March of 2023 the very end of February 2023 in case you were wondering um, so let's start with the very first basic thing this is a viewfinder you're gonna put your eye in that to take a picture like this Right, only going to not forget to put a lens on there. Um, and so this is called the EVF, or Electronic Viewfinder. There's also a LCD screen here. I'm just going to call it the screen, which when your eye is not in the viewfinder, this is the viewfinder. When your eye goes in the viewfinder, it covers that little sensor right there. And then this appears in the viewfinder. So very cool, this EVF. This shows you exactly what the exposure will look like. This shows you what your picture is going to be like, and that's not the way it has always been. The DSL cameras don't have this, so you can take a picture and it can come out horrible, but yet you think it comes out fine. So I'll explain that more in a little bit later on. Let's see, so we have the menu button I showed you. You, of course, take a picture by pressing this front button. That's called the shutter button, but there's a little more to it than that. See that little square right there? That's called the focus box, focus box. And you line that up on a target, and you half press to let the cannon focus in on detail, sharpness detail. It looks for a face. It looks for a body. We can make it look for an eye. It looks for contrast and detail. Once it turns green, you're ready to go full press, and you got the picture. It's going to pop the picture up here. We're going to turn that off because that's really annoying. We can call up a picture anytime by hitting this little arrowhead button right here. And there's the picture. We can blow it up. I'll show you how to put the focus box on this so you can see where exactly the focus was. These, This is also, I, I should tell you, this is really called the focus point. It doesn't look like much of a point, does it? It's a box, so I call it the focus box. But officially, Canon calls it the focus point. Okay, we have some dials here. So we have a main dial right here. So the main dial will control the shutter speed. We have a back dial right here. I guess better to call this the middle dial. And then there used to be a back dial here on my R5 and R6. There's a third dial here. So one of the annoyances with this camera is that there's only two dials. If you're an experienced birder, you like to have all of the three members of the exposure triangle set up here, here, and here, so you can easily move them with your fingers. But there's only two of them here. So this one moves the shutter speed, as I said, and this one moves the aperture. So how do you move ISO on this one? How do you control it? You actually push this little button right next to the shutter here, or right next to the shutter button that's called the MF button. If you push that, now this main dial will allow you to scroll and turn up your ISO or make your ISO whatever you want. It's called ISO. I call it ISO. Okay. There's an info button right here so you can toggle between the different 
screen views that you can have. I like to have my histogram up there so I make sure I don't shoot things too white. So that's important. It's got a lot of information. Sometimes it's too much though so you can turn that down. You can see a one-shot view of all of your settings here. I'll show you how to turn that off or modify that in the next part of this video. There are the three infamous back buttons right here. Stock out of the box, they're set to do different things. This is the AF on button. This is the star button. Uh, this is the, I call it the checkerboard button. It looks like a checkerboard kind of. If you push that, you see a little menu system has come up. And that says trash can does that. So if you push the trash can, it'll jump the focus box back to dead center of the screen. So we can push that again. If you hit the info button, it'll magnify things. So hit the info button and we magnified Gumby there. So that's pretty handy at, at if you can't see a little tiny bird in the bush and want to get a better view of it. And that'll hold to take a picture of it. So you can really get some sharp pictures. You could even use the manual focus to really zoom in on that with that little magnifying glass there. Uh, the set just takes it back to the regular menu. So that's kind of cool. Uh, let's see, what else can I show you, beginners? The Q button, did we say that? So you just push this button straight in, and there is a sub-menu with the key settings. We'll go over this in the video, but it's, there's a column of settings here and a column of settings here. The AF is the most important because that brings up your seven different autofocus systems right there, and you can tap between them. When your eye's in the viewfinder, which I encourage you to practice, keep your eye in the viewfinder, it's kind of hard to, to pull those up without taking your eye out, but I'll show you how to set that up so it's really easy to do that. And I think that's about it. There is a scroll, little trackpad or scroll pad here, which is really annoying. We're going to shut that off in the main part of this video. Why? Because when you grab your camera, your thumb will slide right over it. And if you have your ISO set up on that, you're going to mess all your settings up. So it's better just to shut that off and get rid of it. This is the only camera that has it. There are so many complaints about it that Canon just got rid of it. Remember, this thing has no internal memory. It has an internal memory called the buffer, but that's only temporary. You can't extract things from the buffer. You need to install, every time, one of these SD cards. I like these SanDisk cards. I've never had a problem with them. This is a really old one. It's only 95 megabits per second. They are now up to 200 megabits per second, these U3 versions. So get a bunch of these. I recommend getting 500 megabits. Get those for about 60 bucks a card. The 120s, these things are, I think, about 20 bucks now. I, used to, I paid way more for these. The price has really dropped. But these are very important. And it's important that these are fast because when you take pictures, that internal memory has to write to that SD card. So you want them to be as fast as possible. All right, I think that will do it. Maybe we can do our first button now. So if you push down this mode button, let's get this right over here in manual for the next part of the video. I'll probably remind you again, but um, that's pretty important. Okay, see you in the next section. All right, in this part of the video, we are going to go over the menu, the extensive Canon menu system, and we're going to show you every single setting you need to make to set this up for bird photography. So just so we're all on the same page, there's a top row of icons. Those are the main menus. Right now I call that the big camera. It really has a name right there. It's called the Shoot 5 menu. I don't know why. Some of them don't make any sense, but I just call it the big camera. Underneath that, there's a submenu system of numbers. And under each submenu, or under the number menu, there's more menus. The kind of kind of horizontal word menus here. And those are the actual menus that we'll be going through. So let's start all the way over at number one on the very first one, image quality. Okay, so image quality, we can go into the menu, of course, by clicking on the screen or pushing this set button here. So stock out of the box, you're set to take JPEG images in RAW. And if which is fine if you don't know how to use Lightroom or Photoshop and is fine if you really don't want to monkey around with the image quality in post. And once you get going on this, you're going to definitely want to set up Lightroom and learn that uh, and then Photoshop. 
But if you don't know how to do that, then just leave it in JPEG. You should know if you're in large, it's a really big file. It's 30 megabytes in size, so you won't be able to send that by email. So if you just want to shoot pictures with this and then upload them to Facebook or Instagram or wherever, you should probably go down to S1, that's 7.5 megabytes, or go down here to S2, which is 3.8 megabytes. You should know, though, in this JPEG mode, the Canon computer is actually modifying your images. And there's some settings that you can use to tell it how you want to modify these images. You do lose that, that data pretty much forever. You could still put JPEGs into Lightroom, but your ability to modify them is greatly decreased. So you always want to shoot raw. Eventually, you want to go toward that goal. You can shoot both if you want. You can shoot raw and JPEG, and that way you can save the images as raw images, and later when you learn Lightroom, you'll be able to go back to these and modify them to your heart's desire. C-RAW, which I'm actually using right now, it's a, called Canon RAW. The file size is almost half that of the real RAW file size. So that's really handy. It doesn't fill up your card as much. And, and I should have said this in the beginner section, but this camera has no memory. It has, you have to put in an SD card to make this work. And I'll flash one of these up so you can see it better than this. But the camera will write to something called the buffer. The buffer will hold it and then write it to your card. So if you shoot in C-RAW, it doesn't fill up your card as much, and it, you don't hit the buffer. That internal temporary memory called the buffer, it's almost like the clipboard on a computer. It's only so big, and if you fill it up, the camera will stop shooting. That's really annoying. So with C-RAW, that doesn't happen as much. Okay, um, so for this video, I'm going to turn off RAW, though, and I'm just going to shoot an S to a little tiny JPEGs. Next one is dual pixel RAW. We don't have to worry about that. Next one is cropping. This is a full frame camera. It's not an APS-C camera. So you can look up videos on the difference between those. Full is always better for bird photography, in my opinion. But if you wanted to crop in the camera, you could do a 1.6 crop on here. And now we can look at the background and look at how close these birds are now. And Gumby and Pokey. And it, just in case you don't remember, let's go back to, let's put it back in full mode here, just so you can see the difference. See the difference between that and 1.6 crop. So it literally is cropped. The images, the corners are trimmed off so the images look much bigger. And for those of you who don't know how to use Lightroom or Photoshop, this might be great. Those of you who just want to send these images, you can crop them right here in the camera. You don't lose any image quality doing this, even if you're shooting in RAW. You don't lose any image quality, but you are losing that outer periphery, so you won't be able to get that back ever. So I prefer to crop in post and just use the full frame, but you are losing pixels like this. My wife uses this all the time. Birds in the bush are small. Most of the birds that we take are far away, and so this helps her because she doesn't like to go into post. So it might work for some people, but I don't like it because I like to do my own cropping in post. Okay, next one is this image review. It's set to two seconds. Let me bump that up so we can see what it does. I'll put it to eight seconds. So if we take a picture of that snowy owl, it displays that picture on the screen and locks you out. You can't see anything while that's going on until it comes back. Now you can always half press the shutter button, but it does interfere. If you have a bird in flight, it will drive you absolutely crazy because it does interfere with your ability to take pictures. So for goodness sakes, let's turn that off right now. Okay, so that's off. So if we want to see a picture, or let's do one of Mr. Bill here. If we want to see a picture, how do we do it? There's a little arrowhead button here you can push. And there's our picture. You can blow it up if you want, just by kind of spreading your fingers apart. And yeah, that's pretty, pretty powerful. And you can scroll between, uh, once you engage this, you can scroll between the different images that you've taken. 
So that's pretty handy. But we don't need that popping up. And so we can pull everything up from that little arrowhead right there. Oh my goodness, release shutter without card. Why Canon continues, even in the R5 and R6, they continue to put this on. Release shutter without card. That means if I forget to put an SD card in here, I can still take pictures. They're written to the buffer, but you can't get them out. You lose them forever. So Canon, for goodness sakes, get rid of this, or at, for the very least, put it disabled by default. And we've been, uh, just not, not just me, not just me, a lot of birders have been upset about that, and Canon apparently doesn't pay much attention to birders, I guess, because that shouldn't be there. And that's just for any type of photography, but yet they continue to. That's a simple firmware, and we have the latest firmware in here, right? Anyway, I digress. Let's go back to the menu. Okay, number two. Nothing to worry about there. Number three. Everything is fine. You don't have to worry about this. I would like to say a word about this exposure simulation. That sets, that turns on the electric view finder. This is absolutely amazing. If you're coming from a DSL camera, you didn't have an electronic viewfinder, and you look through this piece of glass, and you saw what you saw with your eye, but that's not what the picture's going to be like. So I think the best way to do this is to turn it off and show you what I mean. Let's turn this off because you maybe came from something where you didn't have a full-frame camera, a mirrorless camera with this EVF here. So if I mess up the exposure, let's say, let's do something crazy. Let's put the shutter speed up to 8,000. So we're going to get a really dark image. But look at how the viewfinder is just showing you what you see through the view. It's not showing you what the picture is going to be like. So if I take a picture of the snowy owl and we, we display it, it's completely underexposed. It's completely dark. We can't barely even see it. So if we turn the electric viewfinder back on, let's enable that, for goodness sakes, we can immediately see, oh my God, I'm way, way underexposed. See, it kind of saves the day, especially for a new photographer. So we need to get that, that shutter speed or get the exposure triangle back in sync. All right, and then if I take the picture, of course, and display the picture, it looks normal again. So very powerful. Let's move on. Okay, number four, white balance. Auto white balance works very good in this camera. And white balance is just the camera's attempt to make the whites look white and to capture the cracked warmth of the room. So I prefer to leave it on auto, except in a studio setting like this where I have three cameras rolling, it's good to put it in Kelvin to, to make sure we're all on the same page. So... Calvin, let's take a quick look at Calvin. So if we go into white balance and we go over here to Calvin and we go down, we can adjust this. We can adjust this by, by clicking on this. Watch what happens if I take it down to a Calvin of 2900 and click OK. That's really, really cold. That's like with a, on a cloudy day. With a, that's worse. That's like in the freezer. There's zero sunlight. There's no yellows and oranges or reds getting through, and that's too cold. So if you're going to set up Calvin, 5200 is pretty much the, the stock value here. So there's, there's 5,200, so, and I can leave it. My other cameras are set like that. So that's the difference there. But I would recommend you guys leave that on auto. Okay, uh, color space here. There's sRGB is fine. I prefer Adobe, though. Colors are a little bit better, I think. And plus, I use Adobe Lightroom, so they tend to match pretty good. But that's not going to make much difference. Picture style is for JPEG shooting only. Remember, the camera modifies your pictures for you. So you have some settings. You could 
try the portrait mode, it, the pictures might be a little bit warmer and less cold, landscape mode, and such. I just shoot in neutral. My wife plays around with those, uh, but I just shoot in neutral for that one. All right, menu five. I don't think there's much. Oh, yeah, we need to talk about touch, the touch shutter here. So it's disabled by default. Let's enable it just for fun, and let me show you how that works. So this, just like the word says, if I touch the shutter, it takes a picture. And that might be cool if you're in a weird angle and you're using your flip screen. And, of course, this has a flip screen that you can twist around and modify Right, it's pretty handy. Okay, that was the magnify button there I hit. <clears throat> but if you touch this, you can take a picture. So, and that might have a purpose, but if you accidentally turn that on, see it says touch screen right there? If you accidentally turn that on, now you're going to be like, oh my God, I want to take a picture of that. And it just drives you crazy. So that's what that is about. So I'm going to turn that off. And it is off by default or disabled by default. We don't need to talk about anything else there. Let's look at number six. Anti-flicker, not for birds, but for, for kids playing basketball in a gymnasium with those flickering lights. Pretty amazing here, and you're taking pictures. If you enable that, it'll take pictures between those light flickers. How it does that, I don't know, but it, I've used that shooting my grandkids before, and it works really good. Silent shutter is the next one. If you're shooting birds, you might consider, especially if you're staking out and you want to be inconspicuous, you might turn that on, and it takes a picture. Watch when I take a picture now. Nothing happens, but you see the white box? So that means you've taken a picture. So that's nice. Some birds are easily disturbed and they'll fly away if they hear the shutter go down. So that's a nice feature there you can play around with. I'm going to turn mine back on though so you can hear my shutter being, being shot. All right, let's go. This is a very important menu. This is the autofocus menu. So here we go with that. Okay, so on menu one here under autofocus, Right off the bat, we need to make an important change. So let's go and look at this one. So we have an option to shoot in one shot or an option to shoot in servo. You always, always, always shoot in servo for bird photography. Let me demonstrate one shot, what that's for first. One shot means that you're shooting a statue. You're shooting something that's not moving. That's why I've been in one shot because these are stuffed animals. They're not moving. But if I take a picture of that bird, let me get on him a little better. I can half press the shutter button and lock on focus. And I can recompose and now full press. The bird will be in focus. It didn't jump onto the background. You can do that for one shot. But that's not the way birds are, are they? Even if that bird is perched, it's going to be turning its head left and right and moving and shifting. You want to always be focusing on that bird, and that's what servo is. So let's go put it back. Or let's put it, you have to change this one, servo. That's what I mean. You won't be happy if you go out and try to shoot birds in one shot. You've got to be in servo mode. So now in that same scenario, of course my bird's not moving, but if I half-pressed and wanted to recompose... It would constantly be focusing on that on that bird, even if it moved and shifted. So that's what you want to go for. Always use servo so it's constantly refocusing and refocusing. Let's look at the next one. So AF method, this is important. In fact, we're dedicating a whole part of this video to this autofocus system and the different methods or modes or systems. They're called different things. But here they are. So these are the seven different autofocus modes. This one we can make into an eighth. The EOS R6 and the EOS R5 have all eight of these modes. The RP doesn't have these modes here, so it has less, which are really useless in this camera. They work great in the R5 and R6, but they're useless, as we'll see here. But we'll come back to these. For right now, let's set it in face detect plus tracking. So this is what you're going to be in most of the time, and you need to make that setting change. I'll show you different places where we can set that as well. So that's an important one. With that one turned on, now eye detection pops up. So we can go into eye detection and turn that on. 
And now the canon is going to try and find an eye. See how it's locked on the snowy owl's eye there? So that's pretty cool. There's a problem with that, though. What if I want to shoot the, the gray owl in the background and my, my face is in the viewfinder, my eye is in the viewfinder, which should be? There's no way to move that or control that, so we need to fix that. So right now you just touch on what you want to take a picture of. But you don't want to do that. Your eye needs to be in this viewfinder. So that's the story with that. Let's go back. So very powerful. And it will try to find the eye. If it can't find an eye, it'll look for a face. If it can't find the face, it goes for a head. If it can't find a head, it goes for a body. If it can't find a body, it'll go for sharpness and detail and contrast it'll look for. Continuous autofocus, always leave that disabled. If you turn that to on, the camera is constantly trying to focus. You put the lens cap on, it's trying to focus, and you'll drain your battery super quick. Touch and drag settings are interesting. They're disabled by default. You want to turn those on. And unfortunately, I can't demonstrate those. If you put your face in the viewfinder and the screen goes off, it becomes a, a scroll pad. And the way you take pictures, your thumb is right here. And so you can literally move this thing called the focus box around almost like a joystick. And it's set up to using the right hand of the screen. It's in relative, which you always want. That means you can kind of half press to move it all the way over to the left. So I recommend setting that up. Unfortunately, I can't demonstrate that. We are going to set up a joystick to move these focus boxes around, but not right now. All right, let's go to the next menu, menu number two. So in number two, this is all about manual focusing. And you're not going to do that too much because the autofocus system is really good. But there are circumstances where you need to use this. If a bird is in a bush with a lot of sticks, the autofocus might be having trouble. So you want to go to manual to get that, get that bird. So let's turn this on. It's, it's off by default. So turn peaking on. And I'll show you what that'll do here in a second. And then there's another one that's really powerful. The EOS RP doesn't have this focus guide, but this is really handy. So let's turn this on and see what this looks like. Now, in the EOS R, there's no button. I can't turn off the autofocus inside the camera. You have to go over to the lens and switch it from AF here. Just click it back to manual focus. And now I'm on manual focus. And you also need to do another thing. See how it's automatically moving? That's because we're on eye and face detect. So we got to change that. So I'm going to use the Q menu now. Just to, We're going to talk about that officially next time. But if I push this Q menu in, we can roll up here to the AF icon. And there's the the seven different autofocus systems right there. I need to choose one of these three box focus systems. And these are all the same. This is a box. The Canon will focus inside the box. It will not go out of it. This is a box with helper points. This is a box with more helper points. So we'll just choose this box for right now. And now I can direct this by tapping on the screen because we don't have this joystick set up yet. Uh, but you can tap on the screen to get this dialed in for right now. Let's do the gray owl back there. And see how there's those arrows? And they're, they're kind of apart. As I get into focus, the arrows come and they'll be perfectly parallel to one another when this is in focus. Now I'm just turning, I'm manually turning the focus dial here. And you can see, see how the owl in the background there, the, that's a gray owl, see how its fur is already turning red? That means we're very close to focus, but that that those green arrows are amazing. You, you can get really sharp images like that. Great for product photography. I'm using that right now for my overhead camera and for my back camera here are both using this method. And then if my hand, if your hand comes in the way or something disrupts it, it'll pop right back. It remembers where you were, so it won't be disrupted by anything. So you'll be using that every now and then, but you have to turn it on, right? So that's the story with that. Let me turn the autofocus back on, though. Okay, let's see what's next. Go to menu. All right, menu three. 
So we're going to come back to this when we fine tune our autofocus system. For right now, it's fine. Just super quickly, tracking sensitivity is the stickiness of your focus box. If you want it to stay stuck to your target, you can mess with that sensitivity. You actually make it more negative if you want it to stick more. If you want it to be able to jump to another subject quickly, you put it to more positive. Again, I'll explain that more in a minute. Acceleration, deacceleration, um, that's at zero, stock out of the box. That's, that's for the movement. That warns the Canon how unpredictable the movements might be when it's trying to track a subject. The AF point auto switching, just leave that to default. They got rid of that completely because it really doesn't do anything in my experience. So just leave that one alone. And we'll come back to that when we fine tune this. So number four, nothing we need. Oh, we actually do need to turn this off. So if we go down to AF assist beam firing, this shoots a little red light. It's not a laser. It's not going to hurt anybody's eyes, but it is annoying. It could annoy the birds. So it's best to turn that off by disabling it. So now nothing's going to bother the birds. Don't have to worry about that one. Number five, you always want this on. You don't have to worry about that. It is on. That means this autofocus system, when you're half pressing, it's always trying to find the bird. It's always trying to focus, refocus, refocus. Limit autofocus methods. We're going to get rid of some of those seven that don't work, like those last three. I'll come back to that and we'll talk more about that one. Okay, you can leave this one stock out of the box here, but let me just real explain it. I do like to set it like this. I don't. I have all my cameras actually filming this video, so I can't show you. But if you choose separate autofocus points in this mode, so if you're taking a, a picture and the camera is just in regular landscape mode like this, when you start it up, the autofocus box will be right in the very center. If you flip over and go into a portrait mode, the autofocus box will be up high where the person's face would be or where the bird's head might be. So that's kind of useful. It doesn't make a huge difference, but I leave mine set like that. This one we're going to come back to when we talk about the focus system. That's a very important setting. We'll come back to that one. There's nothing much I need to say in this. This is called the Play One menu. On number three, though, there is one setting we need to make. If we go that AF point display, enable that always. So this is very cool. If we take a picture of, let's say, the snowy owl here, but there's a lot of sticks around, and I took a picture. You know, I'm not sure. Am I really on the owl's eye, or am I on that stick in the background? You can go check the picture, and it shows you exactly where the focus box was. This is awesome. We got the bird right on its face. So that's really, really handy. And it doesn't bother you when you're shooting. So always put that one on. And there's nothing else we need to talk about there. Uh, the wrench, I don't think there's too much we need to talk about here. There's where you can format your card. If you get a new card. Some birders, they format their card every single time they go out. I know some professionals who do that. I do that about once a month. But you can play with that if you want. Uh, power savings. Now, I did make a change here before the movie started because I don't want this camera to power off and then take two seconds to come back on. I recommend always turning this stuff off as much as possible. I turn the display to 30 minutes. It won't go any higher. I wish I could disable it. That's not super important, but this one, auto power off, is set to three minutes. And if this camera you're walking through the woods and the camera powers off and you don't know it and there's that rare bird that you've been after and you pull the camera up and it takes two seconds for this camera to come on the bird might take off so make sure you disable that one the viewfinder you can do the same thing it's three minutes I disable it. I don't like my camera sleeping. I want it ready to go. I just take an extra battery with me. The battery life is amazing uh, with this camera. I mean, well, I won't get into batteries, but try to get one of these, though. I'll flash up the type. Uh, these are for the R5. This thing will last for like three hours with this. It's amazing. Anyway. Let's go back to the menu, try to stay on point here. Uh, display brightness, I 
because you're this is the display screen so when you're out in a lot of sun it might be a little hard to see with the stock four setting so you might want to kind of bump that up i usually bump it up to six right here i'll leave it at four for now so i don't mess up all my camera settings but i would recommend moving that up to number six you can set the date here and the language and uh, this this color display uh, you can mess around with that i usually leave that alone though number three uh, the beeps, we don't, these beeps drive me crazy, so you can turn off the beeping. You don't want, they might disturb the birds as well, so disable the beeps. Battery information gives you an idea how your battery's faring. Got 87% left. I've taken 15 shots, so that's kind of nice to look at every now and then. Don't need to worry about that. Shooting display, so we can go into shooting display, and if we go into screen info, this is the different views that pop up on your display screen and you can turn these off where do they live so if we hit the info button here see how we just we go through all those that are checked let's turn this one off i don't i don't need that one so let's go turn that one off so let's go back to menu shooting display screen info settings it's not that one, it's not that one, it's not that one, it's that one. Just just push it, click it. You can click it with your finger. Don't forget to hit OK. And now when we go back and scroll through these different screen modes, it's completely gone. Okay, and you can even modify these further, but that's not super important to getting this set up for birding. Number five, don't need to worry. Everything is turned off here. In the R5 and R6, there is an airplane mode that I turn on to make sure nothing comes on and drains your battery. Number six here, you can mess with this. There's the firmware, the latest firmware we're using, 1.8.0. The date of this video is February of 2023, so it is the latest. The little camera here, there's not a whole bunch we need to talk about. But we are going to be using this a lot on, on number menu for this custom buttons menu. We're going to be going into that one a lot to make some changes to these buttons to better set this up for birding. We'll come back to that one. Nothing here and nothing here. You can clear everything. Uh, the star, you can set up your favorite settings here. If you want to configure menu one, you can you can register settings it has every single menu setting in here you could possibly want and let's just grab one out of the blue here and if we register it now when we go back to the star menu there it is HDR mode so it's kind of handy you can put format up here I usually put format up here so I can jump to it quick or so that's kind of handy all right, that'll do it for the menu system. Now let's talk about the Q menu system. All right, guys, so there's another menu system. It has some overlap with the real main menu system here, and that's the Q button. So on your screen, you can tap that little Q menu to invoke the Q menu. Um, you can also go, if your eye is in the viewfinder like it's supposed to be, you can put your thumb right in the middle of this semi joystick and push in. There's the Q menu. So let's talk about that. So we have two rows of icons that we can go through by pushing this down arrow or just by tapping as well. If you tap on this one, it takes you out of the Q menu. So let's look at some of these. So we just talked about briefly where the autofocus methods lived. You remember? This is a pop quiz. Where do they live? Where did I show you them for the first time? Great. Under Menu... If you go to Menu, Autofocus, Autofocus Method, there they are. So you can make a setting here, and it will remember this. If you go to the Q menu to find these Autofocus Methods, which is right here, you have to scroll up to that one that says AF. There they are, right there. Uh, but did you see it kind of blew it, but it was on the one that we made settings to in the menu setting. So it will remember. Let's set it on this one here. So that's a box focus with assistance points. If we go back into the menu, 
under AF method, it's set automatically. So they, they remember each other there. They're not working against each other at all. Okay, so let's go back into the Q menu. And we're going to go over these in a section of the video all by itself because they're so important. But that's where they are. If you go down to servo, there's servo one shot. We said never, ever, ever be in one shot. We always want to be in servo. So be careful. I show this to you because you might accidentally hit that and go into one shot and wonder why all of a sudden your birds aren't in focus. So be careful of that. This one is new. This is the drive mode. And right now I'm in single shooting mode. So what that means is I press the shutter button, half press it to lock the focus, and let's get all that stuff off there. There we go. I half press, and then I full press to take the picture. When you're out birding, that's not what you want to do, though. You want to take multiple pictures because you might capture an expression of the bird that is unique. Maybe the bird is yawning. Uh, who knows? But you want to take as many pictures as possible. And so... You can go into this next one, high speed continuous. So this is about seven frames per second in the EUSR. And that's plenty fast. Even a bird in flight, that's a lot of pictures. It's not 30 frames per second or 20 frames per second, uh, but it's still plenty for bird photography. Maybe not hummingbirds if you want to freeze their wings. Uh, but yeah, it still freeze their wings. So it's 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 plenty. So that's the one you want to stay in. There's a couple other modes here. So there's a low speed continuous. Okay, and then there's there's this delayed timer. So if I push invoke that one, now when I push the shutter, see how it's blinking? That's the, the laser, the red light that we've already turned off, but it still works here. When it starts blinking fast, it's going to take the picture right now. So you can do selfies with this. So I use this all the time. My wife and I are out when I want to take a picture. So that's really useful. That's only on the Q menu. That's the only place you can find that. For right now, I'm going to set mine back into single shot. Let's see what else is hanging out in here. So this is metering mode. You always want to leave it on this stock one evaluative. If you start seeing weird things in your camera, like the spot metering mode, See, we got a circle in there now. That means you're not in the right mode. This will work fine for birds that are that you're not trying to reposition. It will look in this circle to determine the proper some of the proper settings, the whiteness, the contrast, and such. The problem with this is though, if you want to half press and compose, and then while half pressing, keeping the bird in focus, it won't it won't stay in the middle. It'll come over here and it'll mess up your color settings, your, your brightness settings. So it's a real problem with Canon, uh, but probably you're just starting out, you're not gonna worry about it much because you'll probably always be keeping the bird in the center of the frame, but, uh, but keep this on evaluative mode. There's plenty of videos on that. You can, if you wanna learn more about it, just Google one of those. There's the flicker, anti-flicker for your grandkids running around in the gym or your kids or whatever. Uh, we're not going to worry about that anymore because this is a birding video. And now let's go over the next menu. That will kick us out of the queue menu. So here is the settings. If you want to jump up to, to a better quality JPEG, you can do that here quickly as well. Uh, you can hit the info button and go into raw here as well. I'm going to turn that off. So that's really handy to have. Maybe you've spotted an eagle and you want, you don't know how to use Lightroom yet, but you want to keep raw photos for the future. That's a good little trick to know. There's the Calvin settings. We're on 5200. You can change those. Uh, we can change those back to, let's change it back to auto. And look at some of the settings here as we go. You can see we we did a fluorescent light look here. And remember, these just apply to the JPEG. So but let's get back to auto white balance. Okay, let's see what else we got here. Uh, picture style, again, for JPEGs, you can monkey around with different, different coloring settings. They don't affect JPEGs at all. So let me turn this back to neutral. There we go. All right, uh, then we have the auto light optimizer. Just leave that alone. Don't mess with that. 
and that's it. And here's cropping. Maybe you find a rare bird and you want to send it, but you, you're too lazy to open up Lightroom. You just want to crop it. So that's kind of nice. You can go right here and crop, do a 1.6 crop. And like I said, that's not going to affect the image quality at all. It just crops. You can do it here in your camera, or you can do it later in Lightroom or some other program. So that's up to you. I Since I, since I only shoot raw, I always shoot in full frame here. And just one myth here. I've, I've seen this floating around. This does not turn this into a 1.6 cropped APS-C camera. That's a whole different thing. Um, I won't talk about it now, but um, I do actually today, I'm supposed to have the EOS R7, which is an APS-C camera. So I'll be talking a lot about that in the near future. I'm excited to get that camera. So let's put it back in full. All right, that'll pretty much wrap it up for the Q menu. All right, guys, in this part, we are going to go over the EOS R and make some button modifications so you can get the most out of this for birding. So here we go. The very first thing we need to do is turn off this scroll pad right here. So it's really easy to do if you haven't monkeyed around with it. So it says use menu to assign functions, no, and then hide next time, yes. Just tick that and that's it. We don't have to worry about it. Remember I said that if you try to set aperture or ISO up on this thing, it's so easy to brush your thumb up against it and throw your settings off when you're shooting in manual. So just don't. Just shut it off. The next thing we should talk about is where are the where are the settings? How do you control your exposure triangle? By default, this main dial right here, that'll control your shutter speed or how, how much light is let in, how fast the shutter clicks. That's great. This middle dial is set up to control your aperture or your F number. So usually I have that back on this dial, but there's no dial here. So where ISO, where do you control that? You have to ha you have to push this little tiny MF button. And it's not too bad because it's right next to your finger. So it's really easy to slide it over. It, you can really feel it with your finger. It's a skinny little button, quite prominent. Push that in and you'll be right on ISO. And then that that tells the wheel that you can now use that to control your ISO level. There is a problem with this though. If you accidentally hit this middle dial, there's several other menu systems that are up here as well. There's the white balance, there's the servo. I mean, you might accidentally put it into one shot and all your pictures will come out bad. Um, so there's your drive speed. I don't recommend keeping these there. I mean, if you want to leave them here, that's fine. I would rather use the Q button. So it's up to you, but I recommend turning those other ones off and just leaving the ISO button right here so you, when you're in the heat of the moment, you don't mess things up. So let's get rid of those other ones. Let's To do that, we need to go into the menu, and I'm going to be taking you into this menu repeatedly. So go to the little camera, go to number four, and then customize buttons just click on that or push the set button, whatever you want to do. And there's a little cartoon of the camera here with, that's actually the front button right here. That one's glowing. If you start moving one of these dials, you can see we're moving through the different, the different buttons that are available for modification. Not all of them, but most of them you can modify. Be careful that you're not in the movie camera mode. If you want to, mo if you want to modify your movie camera, then you need to be in this column. But we want to stay over here. So let's go find that. Let's go find that button, that MF button. And there it is. But see, I'm in the movie camera, so that wouldn't work. But let's go back to here. Let's go into that by tapping on it or clicking the set button. And the dial function is fine, but to refine that, there is an info detail set. So click on that, and now we can see everything that's set up to that little tiny MF button, and that's too much information. So turning it off is simple. All you do is highlight the one you want to turn off and click on it. Highlight, hit again, it turns it off. Highlight it, hit it again, turn it off. Okay, so now everything's off. Don't forget to hit this next button and then OK. 
Now, if we go back and hit that, that's the only thing there. If you accidentally turn the middle dial, nothing happens. So you'll always be ready to go to change the ISO by hitting this MF button. You won't have to worry about anything else. So that's the first modification I would do. The next one we should do is we should fix this joystick. So we're going to be looking at the autofocus methods next. But if we're in a box mode like this, I mean, you can tap around the screen to move the box, but that's not the way to do it because your eye should always be in the viewfinder on the targets. Uh, you can scroll around. I can't demonstrate that, but you can scroll around because we set up the screen to do that when it's turned off. It's nice to be able to move this around. So let's set these these. 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 9 o'clock buttons up so they're functional and we can move the focus box around. So go back into menu, go into custom buttons again, and now let's go find the, one of these. And all you got to do is set one and the other ones will automatically set. So I believe it's 13 clicks. I've done this so many times and we should pop right up on them. There they are. So there's 12 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock. So any one of these. Let's open one of those up. And all we have to do is go over to this one right here. Direct autofocus point selection. And that will make this alive. And, it, and look what it did. It set all of them to the same thing in the camera mode. So now if I go back in, now I can move that box around just by clicking one of these. If I click on the 9 o'clock, it goes that way. If I click on the 6 o'clock, it goes down. If I click on the 3 o'clock, it goes to the right. So that comes in handy when we're out in the field and our, our eye is in the viewfinder. How do you jump back to the very center? So you hit the trash can. That's when you should write down because that can drive you crazy if it gets off center. It's like, how do I get it back to the center? Now you can move it back to the center with these. Uh, this kind of modified joystick, or you can just hit the trash can, and there we go. So that's set up. Let's go to the next setup. Okay, the next problem, we haven't really talked about what they do, but we do know that the seven autofocus methods are right here, and we have to use different ones of these in different situations. So the trouble is, if you want to change settings, you really have to take your eye out of the viewfinder, you have to hit the Q button. You have to make sure you're on the AF icon here. And then you have to scroll over to select, let's say, face, face plus tracking. It takes too long. Wouldn't it be nice to set one of these buttons up to do that for us so we can keep our eye in the viewfinder and just hit a button to do this? So you can set any one of these three buttons up to toggle between the seven different autofocus methods. I prefer to do this star here because the autofocus button here, this AF button, when you grab your camera to to pick it up and go on to the next location, your thumb slides down and you can accidentally hit that and mess things up. So I prefer to do the star button here. So let's set the star button up to do this, to cycle between those autofocus systems. So go back to the same place, little camera, go back to menu number four, and then customize buttons. And let's go find the star button by just turning one of these wheels. There's a bunch of ways to do this. And there's the star button. See how it glows orange? That's that button right there. Make sure we're in the camera mode, not the movie mode. And let's go into that menu. And here's the magic. I see the magic button right there. It's called Direct Autofocus Method Selection. Two rectangles with a double-headed line. That's a magic button. So if you engage that button, watch what it does just by clicking the star button. See how we cycle between all seven of the autofocus systems. So very cool. So it's, sometimes it's nice in the heat of the moment to set more than one to do the same thing. So let's set this little checkerboard button up uh, to do the same thing. Uh, which normally doesn't do that much other than pull up that menu. So exactly the same procedure. Go to Menu, uh, go to Customize Buttons, same location, and let's go find that little checkerboard menu. There it is. So just jump into that, and there's our Direct Autofocus Method Selection. 
click OK on that. And now either one of these is set up. So if you're in the heat of the moment and you can't remember which button, you can just mash one of them back there and it'll toggle between these methods. Now, there's too many of these methods. And we're going to explain these in a minute, but it's nice to limit some of these. So actually, that, that's a good segue into the next section where we get deeper into these autofocus methods. So let's do that. I'm going to hook up my Ninja screen recorder for this. I have a Ninja V, so I can share my viewfinder, what I see, with you. Let's do that right now. So we're going to talk about these seven autofocus functions. Remember, by hitting the Q menu, there they are right there. Let's start by talking about this one. This is the one you're going to be in most of the time. It's called Face Plus Tracking. I call it Face and Eye Detect because remember, like the sign says right there, we have the Eye Detect enabled. Remember, if you go to the menu setting and you go to autofocus number one, make sure that eye detection is enabled. It's disabled by default. You want full power out of this autofocus. You need to enable that. Now, in the EOS R and EOS R6, there is an animal setting uh, where it'll detect birds, cats, and dogs, which helps even more. It doesn't. That wasn't invented when this was uh, released. So we don't have that and they never upgraded that for us. But if you're just jumping over here from maybe the beginning, make sure servo is on, not one shot. By default, one shot will be on. So make sure that is set. There's those same autofocus methods. They will remember each other. So you can set those in the Q menu or here. And continuous was disabled. And yeah. So let's check this out. So now we're in this eye and face detect and it does a decent job of grabbing the snowy owl right there so that's pretty cool I can take a picture of that and it'll it'll show up okay I won't hit the review button because I'll lose my ninja will be disconnected so that's pretty cool but anybody see a problem what if I want to take a picture of that gray owl in the background now you guys can tap on your screen to tell us hey get over to the gray owl but if you're shooting like you're supposed to be shooting with your eye always in this viewfinder you you can't do it we set these buttons up to move the focus box but it's not responding because there is no focus box on this eye and face detect we need to go make one so that's another button modification we're going to do right now so let's go into the menu go into autofocus and let's scroll over to number five and right here's the problem. This is initial servo autofocus point for face plus tracking. It's set to auto. That lets the Canon autofocus system run wild to, to look for what it thinks is best. We want to control that more. So let's make a focus box here. So if you choose either one of these settings, you will make a focus box. It'll start right in the center if you choose this one. If you choose this one, the focus box will pick up from where it left off if you're you the last time you used another focus box it remembers that I don't think there's any reason for that one let's just leave it to start the autofocus box in the center so click set okay and there it is make sure it's there okay now let's go watch so we have a nice big focus box there and now we can get the owl and now the arrows work for us so if our eye is in the viewfinder, I can just hit these arrows and man maneuver this. I can also use the touchpad here. See how my thumb is going? Now again, the ninja is knocking the screen out, so it doesn't work. But for you guys, that box, that autofocus box will be moving. So what's the story with that? The cannon will look inside the box for a face and for an eye, or in this order, for, for an eye, a face, a head, and a body. If I can't find that, it looks for sharpness and detail and contrast. So if I half press, you would think it would find the eye, because we can all see the eye, but it doesn't. So this eye detect is not very accurate. When we go out and shoot birds in a little while, it does terrible at finding the eye. If we go on the snowy owl here, I think it'll do a little better. See, it actually did find an eye, just to prove that it does work, but it's not very accurate. 
the R5, when I did this demo, and maybe I'll flash those videos or that a section of that video up. When I went here and half pressed, it jumped right on not the face of the snowy owl, it jumped right on the gray owl's eye. So it was much more powerful than this. Same with the R6. So this has a problem with regard to the eye tracking, but it does work in the perfect environment for it. Okay, now what if we want to get a picture of Pokey? So we line up on Pokey, and there's two problems here. It can't find Pokey. It's locking onto the fur of the gray owl there. So we need to switch autofocus systems. So let's go back to the Q menu, and let's go over to one of these three. These are the three box focus methods, I call them, because they all have a box, just like the other one did. There's this exact same box, but this time the Canon is instructed and ordered to keep the autofocus within the box. It will never go outside of the box. So when I half press the shutter, the odds are it's probably got pokey there, okay? But there's still another problem. That's a pretty darn big focus box. So there is a way to get a smaller focus box for these smaller birds and for pokey and things, whatever you're shooting. So let me show you how to do that. If we go back to menu and we go back to number one and we have a box selected, this will only show up if a box is, one of those three boxes is selected. There's an option for auto focus frame size. It's normal. If we go into that menu, there is a small setting, which is wonderful. Now, watch. See how much smaller that box is? So the odds of us getting pokey are much greater with that small box. You should always leave it in this setting for birding. Unfortunately, if we go to the other boxes, though, let's go to the box that has some assistance points around it. See, now we're back to the big box again. The other thing I should mention about these boxes is the autofocus system will not look for an eye in any of these other boxes. The only place it looks for an eye is that face plus tracking or face and eye detect. So it still looks for a face, a head, and a body, but you don't. it doesn't look for an eye here. So what is the deal with these assistance points? They assist the main box. You're still going to use the main box there in the middle to look for a face, a head, a body sharpness or detail if it can't find it let's say let's say mr bill moved just as we're about to take the picture and the big box can't see anything anymore it will ask these boxes around the corners hey does anybody see anything that that looks like a face or a head or a body or something at least sharp with detail and the box at nine o'clock there it says you know what i got something pretty sharp and in detail here so the main box then says, okay, we're going with you. So the autofocus will go through that little box at 9 o'clock there to take the picture. So that's very handy. A lot of professionals use that one. Actually, they, they tend to use the next one over, which is the same thing. It's a focus box in the middle. It just has more associate points or assistant points around it. So if Mr. Bill moves, the odds of a skidding Mr. Bill still in focus are pretty good. So that's the story with these. But remember, these boxes don't look for an eye. Let's talk about these three. They're all the same. These are the zone autofocuses. Let's pull this one up, and now we have a gigantic box. So this is great for birds in flight that have to be kept within a larger area. So this, this one compared to the R5 and R6 is not very accurate, as we'll see when we go out to the bird feeder too. It's just not very accurate. In the R5 and R6, it was locking onto the face almost all the time. It still won't look for an eye, though, but it'll look for a face, a head, and a body. This one did really poorly in uh, with birds in flight, so that's a limitation with this one. Uh, the next one over, and remember, how can I jump ahead now? Remember we made some button modifications? Rather than going back to the Q menu, yeah, we can hit the star button. See how the star button will now cycle between all seven of the Canon autofocus systems. So we have a vertical box. Again, the Canon will not focus outside of that box. So, But if we try to get Mr. Bill, forget it. Now you might be able to tap. My screen doesn't work. You could probably tap and get Mr. Bill in focus that way. But you'd have to take your eye out of, this, out of the viewfinder, and we don't want to do that. And the next one over 
is a horizontal box. I always turn these off. Even in the R5, there's no sense that you have these things in here. So let me show you how to actually get rid of these and turn them off so they're not interfering. So to turn them off, we go back to the menu, autofocus menu 5, and then we scroll up limit autofocus methods. Jump into that, and there's another place where we can find our autofocus settings, our autofocus systems, and we don't need all these things checked. So let's scroll over. Let's scroll over and get rid of that one. And let's get rid of that one. And honestly, let's get rid of that one. It doesn't really work that well in the USR. And yeah, we can leave the other ones if you want. But I mean, this one I don't use. So those are the three that I really use for this camera. So great. Let's go and click OK, which is harder for me because I can't touch on it. There we go. OK. And now look, if we go back to the Q menu, there's only those three available to you. The other ones are grayed out. Or if we go to toggle between them or cycle between them, there's only three to cycle between. So that's pretty cool. All right, that'll do it for this part of the video. Let's go out into our backyard and shoot some real birds and see how this does with a 100 to 400 RF and a 100 to 500 RF. Off we go. All right, guys, let's see how this Canon EOS R performs. I'm about 10 to 15 yards away from that bird feeder. I just filled it up with their favorite food and that fence they like to land on. Let's see what we can see. I've got the 100 to 500 on here. Okay, let's see where we are. Okay, we'll start with the eye and face detect. See how that display is messing me up? See how it blocks the blocks the picture. Okay, now let's go to spot. This is our bread and butter right here. This is the small spot. Sorry about the airplane noise. Nothing I can do about it. We're like 10 miles away from an airport, and it sounds like there's an airport right next to us. Still using the small box. Let's try something else too though. Here's the box with assistance points. Great, now watch how terrible these zone focuses are. Absolutely terrible. Oh, there's got them there. There's no way it can pick that out, even on the bird feeder. These, these are absolutely worthless. Same with this. In the R5 video, they were a lot better. Remember, it looks inside the box first, so it shouldn't grab the fence. Let's try these again. get some of this information off there. You can hear the nut hatch. You hear that it's, it's like wants to come to the feeder. There it is. Can't get it. Right? Miss the shot. It was $3,000 when I bought it. Look at that. I'm on eye face detect. It certainly didn't get a eye there. There's that orange and yellow one. Come on, lock on that. Okay, we can even drop our... 
let's see where our uh, histogram is. Now we're pretty focused. That's pretty good. ISO 500. These should be very good images. Let's go to the spot focus now, the small spot focus. Interesting to see if I can actually hit his eye here. I'm not using the viewfinder, so I have to use this ninja here, so. But I don't think that's the problem. There's a whole bunch of them lined up. There's a rare bird coming out right there. There she is. <laughs> All right, guys, let's wrap things up. So what have we learned about the Canon EOS R? Well, it's a full frame camera. It's 30 megapixels. Its autofocus system is not very good. So we saw it in action here in the studio and the eye detect in particular really had trouble locking on to the birds, which are maybe five feet away from us. I think we got it to lock on the snowy owl's eye one time and that was it. If I half pressed, you would think it would find the eye because we can all see the eye, but it doesn't. So this eye detect is not very accurate. When we go out and shoot birds in a little while, it does terrible at finding the eye. If we go on the snowy owl here, I think it'll do a little better. See, it actually did find an eye, just to prove that it does work, but it's not very accurate. It does okay at locking onto the head or the face, but not, uh, not great with the eye at all. And then when we took it outside with real birds that were feeding at a feeder, that was about 10, 15 yards away, it did not lock on a single eye the whole time we were out there no matter what lens I used. So you might as well turn the eye detect off on this. And that's what I found. I mean, I have over 100,000 bird pictures with this. I used this for a long time before I got an R6. So I didn't use the eye detect. In fact, most of the time I shot in one of the box modes, most of the time in the smallest, that little spot focus mode. And then when birds were flying, I would switch over to the zone focus. And that was like, eh hit or miss with that. The R5, which I've used for the last year, is amazing. Uh, and we saw that. I did a video on that in this very setup, and that grabbed eyes like crazy. Had no problems grabbing eyes from even quite a ways away. So, uh, But that's a $4,000 camera. This is a $1,400 camera. So, you know, that's what you would expect. But if you get the EOS R7, you get maybe even better than the EOS R5 with regard to that eye and face tracking and such. There's problems with the R7 though, right? The buffer is terrible. It's an APS-C camera. So yeah, it should be interesting when the EOS R8 comes out, which is a full frame camera as well, right at the same price point. So uh, we're gonna have a lot of videos to make. There's gonna be tons of videos on these three cameras. So trying to help you make a decision on which one to buy for bird photography. All right, that'll do it. So please remember, give me a thumbs up. Go on, hit it. It's right down there. Don't, don't be scared. Hit that thumbs up button. Consider subscribing as well. We'll see you in the next video.